Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video I'm going to introduce you to Swift Lint. I often consult with and work with new iOS developers, and I ask them to share their code with me so that I can see what they're doing. Invariably, I spend a lot of time when I first open their code fixing up what it looks like. As a new developer, it's easy to develop bad habits and use non-conventional naming and style practices. Swift Lint is an open source tool to enforce Swift style and conventions. It's developed by Realm, and you can set your coding style rules and force them during development. It's based on the no longer active GitHub Swift style guide that was an attempt to encourage patterns that accomplish the following goals. To increase rigor and decrease the likelihood of programmer error. To increase clarity of intent. To reduce verbosity. And to create fewer debates about aesthetics. In this tutorial, I'll step you through the process of installing Swift Lint on your Mac and how you can start using it to clean up your code. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. You can visit the Swift Lint GitHub page here and I'll leave a link in the description below. It gives you several options for installation. Now, I'm a big fan of Homebrew, so that's what I'm going to use. The remainder of this page provides you with a number of practical examples. What I'm going to do is to take you through a real example to lint a sample project that I've put together for this video. The app is really only built for the specific purpose of showing you Swift Lint. I've created a sample arc that displays a rainbow. You can tap on the Hide button and it disappears, and tapping again reveals it. What I've done though is broken several of the Swift style guide rules, and we're going to let Swift Lint discover them and eventually help us fix them. There are four Swift files in this project, and three of them have some problems that we'll discover shortly. First though, let me show you how to install. The first thing you need to do is to install Homebrew. To install it, all you need to do is to copy this script from the Homebrew website. Open a Mac terminal application, and I'm just using the standard default terminal, and paste it in here and hit enter. Now I've already done that, so I won't repeat it here, so make sure that you do that first. Once Homebrew is installed, you can return to the SwiftLint GitHub page and copy the command to install SwiftLint using Homebrew. So I'm going to return to Terminal, and it's here that I would run that command. Again, I've already done that, so pause the video now and come back once it's been installed. Using SwiftLint from the command line is really easy. Let me dismiss my project and my web browser to reveal my demo project that's on my laptop. In Terminal, if I type CD and then a space, and then drag that folder onto the terminal window, I'll change the directory to that path after I've pressed Enter. Then, all I have to do is type Swift Lint, all one word, into the terminal, and press Enter once more. Let me stretch out this window. SwiftLint will scan the hierarchy from that initial directory path and analyze all of the Swift files and display the issues that it's found. We see that there are four files and it found 22 violations, one of which is serious. Now you may only find 21 because as you'll discover later on, I have a problem with my configuration file that I will fix. However, that's not going to stop us from proceeding here. It lists all of the violations along with what the issue is. Before I start to correct these errors, however, I want to add source control to my project so that I can revert back to the original. We're going to be looking at several ways in which we can resolve these issues. So return to your Xcode project, and then from the source control menu, choose New Git Repository. Let's bring back that report then and see what the problems are. Starting from the top in Content View, I see that there are four errors. 
it gives me the line number and the column of the error, like this one on line 28 at column 18. It's a comma violation, and there should be no space before and only one after a comma. So let's return to our project and content view and go to line 28, and I see that problem here. The space after is missing. And the line break before the comma is what's causing the other issue. So let's remove it. If I return to Terminal and do a Command K, that will clear the console. And then if I press the up arrow on the keyboard to reproduce that last command, I can hit Enter once more to repeat the process. Now there are 21 issues. You should be seeing 20. I'm going to repeat that process of the Command K and up arrow repeatedly. The lines for Content View are now down at the bottom of the listing, so let's continue on with that file. Line 21 is a line length violation, and the guide says that it should be a maximum of 135 characters. Let's see what we can do about that. Back in Xcode, this line is long and not particularly readable. We can separate this code by entering return before each of the periods to separate the actual circle modifications. And if we'd like, we can also separate the stroke properties by pressing enter after the comma. This is much more readable. If I return to terminal and do another command K and repeat the swiftlint command, I'm now down to 20 issues. 19 for you, I hope. There are two trailing white space issues here on lines 38 and 44. Let's see what those are. Line 38 has this extra line. That's a trailing white space, so let's remove it. Now since I removed that line, line 44 is now line 43, and I see it has an extra line as well, so let's remove it and return to terminal once again. Hmm, I still have that one trailing white space error, but I thought I had deleted that extra line, which is now line 42. If I return to Xcode, it looks good, but if I place the cursor to the right of that line, I see that there are actually some spaces after it, so I need to delete those spaces too. If I return now to Xcode and try again, I'm down to 18 violations. You should be down to 17. Now before I tackle this identifier name violation and some of the others, I see I have lots of trailing white space violations in my other files. And these are easy to fix, so let me do these now. In the view model, they are at lines 31, 27, 23, and 19. And if I work from the highest number backwards, I'll be able to remember those numbers and they won't go out of shift because I've deleted earlier lines. So let's return to Xcode and work on that. I'm removing all of those extra lines. If I return to Terminal and then clear and execute that command again, I see I'm now down to 14. 13 for you. Let's do the same with the rainbow color file on lines 19, 18, and 9. And I also see line 19 has a vertical white space issue. So let's see what that's all about and fix it. The problem with line 19 is that's causing the two issues is that double line spacing. So let's remove them both. Line 9 looks okay because we're allowed an empty line after a comment, but if I click on that line, I see that extra space, so I need to remove it. Back in terminal now, I'll clear and run again, and now I'm down to 10 errors. 9 for you. Let's cover some more easy ones. Rainbow color has a trailing new line at line 29, a trailing comma at line 26, and an opening brace violation at line 19. Some comma and colon violations at 26, 
18, and 14. So let's check all those out in the rainbow color file. You're only allowed one blank line at the end of a file, so let's remove that extra one. This comma here is not needed after the last element in an array, so we can remove it. Colons, as it said back in the report, should be followed by a space. And the opening brace should always be on the same line as the variable or a function declaration. So let's remove that line break. I'm going to return to Terminal and Clear and Run. View model has a colon violation, so we can fix that on line 19. I'm down to three errors now, and one of them is serious. That's the identifier name violation where the variable name should start with a lowercase character. If I return to the view model bin and refactor the all rainbow colors, I can use lowercase here. Returning now to terminal, I'm down to those two errors. Here's where I have my problem. You will see only one, hopefully. I've messed something up in my default file. As you'll see that in a second, I'll fix it. The ID property should not be giving me this error, but we'll resolve that eventually. I use an ID a lot in my Swift code, and I also tend to use VM as well to represent my view models. And I understand that you want to use property names that are descriptive, so a minimum of three characters is justified in most cases. For this project right now, I just want to ignore those errors, but I also want a clean report. At the end of the line, you'll see the name of that violation. It's identifier underscore name in both cases. Let me return to those two files, rainbow color and content view and indicate for those files that I want to ignore that particular rule. And you can do that with a comment that starts with Swift lint, followed by a colon, no space, then the word disable, then a space, and then the name of the rule that you want to disable or ignore. And for us, that's the identifier underscore name. Let me copy and paste that into my other file now. When I run this now, I see that I'm error-free. Now, I'm not particularly happy with ignoring that rule in the entire file, so I'm going to want to fix that so that it just ignores the ID and VM, and we would catch all other shorter names. So let's return to Xcode now then and revert back to the start by choosing Discard All Changes from the Source Control menu. If I return to the terminal now and clear the screen and run Swift Lint once more, I see that I'm back to those 22 errors. As I mentioned, I thought I had something wrong with my version of Swift Lint. So I went ahead and I reinstalled it. So let me do one Swift Lint on this file now to see if I get the same errors. Now I get only those 21 violations like you are probably seeing. That ID property is now not giving me an error. Perfect. SwiftLint is a command line tool. And if you saw my video on building a command line tool, I'll leave a link in the description below, you'll know that all good command line tools have help, and many accept different arguments or options. To access the command line help, you usually just issue the dash H command. So let's try that with a swiftlint-h. It shows me all the different help commands. Let's try one out. Let's check the version number out now. Okay, it's not even at 1.0 yet. Now, what about these other commands? If I issue the command swiftlint docs, it opens my web browser and presents the documentation page. This contains the same information that we saw on the GitHub repo. 
Returning now to terminal, let's issue the swiftlint generate dash docs command. And this is interesting because what it does is it generates a folder of markdown files in your project, one for each of the different rules. You can see these here in the finder. Let's take a look at the identifier underscore name rule. I'm going to open it in my markdown editor of choice, which is Typora. And I can see that it's enabled by default. And there is a default configuration that is at a minimum length of three to generate a warning and two generate an error. There is one excluded one, however, and that's ID. So that's why I'm no longer getting a warning for that ID property and why I knew there was something wrong with mine. I also see that I must start with a lowercase letter. That's why it generated that error. We're going to customize this rule in a minute. The file also shows me some non-triggering examples, along with some ones that would trigger errors or warnings. So what rules actually are in place? Back in terminal, I can issue the command swiftlint space rules. And this lists all of the rules that are available, both those enabled and those not enabled. Now, if you want more information on what is possible with that rules argument, you can type swiftly into help rules to find out what you can add as an option to the rules command. Always swift lint followed by help and the name of the help command. We see here that one of them is dash E, which will list only the enabled rules. So when we try that and issue that command, we see now only the rules enabled in our default configuration. But what else can we learn from digging into the help system? When we type swift lint without any subcommand, the default is the lint command. And what we're actually doing is swift lint space lint. So let's see if there is more help on that command by issuing swift lint help lint. There are lots of commands, and I'll leave it up to you to explore most of them, except this one, dash dash fix, looks really interesting. It says it'll correct violations whenever possible. Well, let's try that. Remember, we've got no fixes so far. First, let's double check to make sure that's the case. Still 21 violations. Now let me issue the swift lint dash dash fix command. It says that it's corrected quite a few errors. Let's see. And just like that, I'm down to three violations. Why did I waste all my time there earlier? If I check Xcode, you can see that our previously untouched project now has a number of source control edits. Let me just quickly fix those two violations here the lowercase violation in the view model, and the line length in content view. I have one remaining error now, and I'm not going to disable that rule. I'm going to customize it for my own purposes to allow VM as a valid property name. You can create your own SwiftLint configuration file that will augment the default one. And you do this by creating a SwiftLint YAML file, YML extension. In this configuration file, you can add, disable, or update the linting rules. If you go to the SwiftLint docs, let's issue that command to open up in our web browser, I can scroll down to the configuration section, and you can see that you can add a swiftlint.yml file to the directory where you run swiftlint from. And by adding a period in front of that file name, we can ensure that it is hidden in the finder by default. 
like the Git repository is. In the YAML file, you can create different sections where you can disable rules or opt into rules that are not already enabled, among many other things. You can also customize existing enabled rules as well. And there are lots of examples here in this documentation, and you can learn from them. You can even create your own custom rules if you like. Well, in Terminal, we are in our demo project directory, and that's where I run SwiftLint from, so that's where I want to store my customized SwiftLint YAML file. Well, in Terminal, you can create a new file using the touch command, followed by the name of the file, like this. If I bring up the finder now, I don't see that file in the directory because of the period. But if I issue these keyboard strokes, command, shift, period, or command greater than, it reveals the hidden files. And I can open that file in any editor that I want. Well, I'm going to open it in Xcode. And I'm going to use Terminal to do that. All I have to do is type open, followed by the name of the file, .swiftlint.yml, followed by a dash A, and the name of the application that I want to use to open it, in my case, the Xcode app. This opens an empty file in Xcode, and I can add to it or edit it. If I do a swift lint to view my errors again, I see that the warning we get is the identifier underscore name. And I want to modify that configuration because that's allowed for that violation. Remember, we looked at the docs and it currently allows ID as a valid property name, but not VM. You can refer to the documentation's example for more help, but this is what you need to do. You start with the identifier name that you want to configure and then add a colon. After, on the next line, you tab or space to indent and provide its first argument, which is minimum length with a colon. Hit return, indent once more, and then add that you'd like this to generate an error warning. And for this, it's still. 3. Hit enter and indent again and add an excluded option. Hit enter, indent once more, and then add a dash with a space and name the first excluded variable. So in my case, vm. Hit enter to get onto a new line, add another dash, and specify id because this file now overrides the default, so we need to include ID. If I return to Terminal now, let me run Swift Lint once more. I no longer have any errors. Perfect. Well, let me look at my Xcode project once more, and I'm going to open the view model file. I see that I'm force unwrapping the first and last colors of the array. We're often told that it's never good practice to force unwrap anything. In fact, there's a rule for that, but it's just currently disabled. Let's enable it. I'm going to return to my YAML file now and add a new section that's called opt underscore in underscore rules, followed by the colon. And then anything following this or any rules following this will now be opted in. So we need to indent and add the name of the rule that you want to opt into. And you do that by adding a dash followed by the rule name. In this case, force underscore unwrapping. Back in terminal, when I run swift lint once more, I see I now have two warnings. Well, what if this is not enough? What if you want to have those displayed as serious errors instead of just warnings? I can return to my YAML file then and override this by specifying that the warning name is followed by error. Now, when I execute the command, I see I get two serious errors. 
Well, so what? Well, I prefer this method of running SwiftLint from the terminal, as I can do that at the end of each one of my coding sessions. But many people like to have this happen interactively, namely, show me the errors in Xcode as soon as I build my project. Well, open the docs once more and scroll down to the Xcode section. Here, they show you how you can add a run script to the build phase of your project. You just need to copy this script here and return to your project. Let's discard all changes so that we can see how this script will work. Select your app target and click on the Build Phases tab. Click on the plus button to add a new run script phase. You can drop this down and paste the script into the space provided. I also like to rename my run scripts in case I got several of them. So I'm going to call this one Swift Lint. Let me open Content View. Nothing seems to have changed, but let me build my application. I'm now getting 16 warnings and three errors. My project won't even compile. I'm getting 19 errors in total, which is correct because we have that YAML file ignoring the short VM property name. But in view model, I have three errors generated now that are more than warnings. These are the three serious errors that we had with Swift Lint. I have to fix these before my project will even run. The rest are warnings that should be fixed. So you can decide how you want to implement Swift Lint. If you're ever going to do any code sharing with anyone else, or if you're going to ask for help from a more experienced coder, I highly recommend that you lint your code first before sharing. The recipient will be impressed by how clean your code is. I hope you found this video interesting and useful. Make sure you subscribe to my channel to get more like this. Thanks so much for watching.